Almighty God, we thank you for your word. Lord, in the 19th, excuse me, the 19th Psalm, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And so as we stand before your word today, Lord, we understand that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, that your word discerns the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that our thoughts and intentions are sincere before you today. Lord, let us receive your word with rejoicing and help your word to bear fruit in our lives. To you alone be glory, Lord, now and forever. Amen. Well, we have been teaching through the book of Colossians in this current sermon series. And, and through the book of Colossians, we've been examining what it means to be a disciple. And so our text today is Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. Uh, if you would, open your Bibles to that passage. And I'll, I'll give you a second to turn there. And, and during that time, I think it would be helpful to explain what exactly a disciple is, at least the way that I'm going to talk about it in the message this morning. So in the simplest terms, a disciple is, is a follower. And so what we're talking about is being followers of Christ. Now, to be a follower, or to be a disciple, you have to acknowledge two basic things, right? First of all, you have to acknowledge that there is authority above you. And then second, you have to acknowledge that it is proper for you to submit to and, and follow that authority. So that's just a very basic definition of disciple. And I'm sure as, as this sermon series goes on, you'll see that fleshed out much more. But that's what I, I want you to keep in mind as we work through the text this morning. And so hopefully you've had enough time to find it. We will read it together now. Colossians 1.24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so the, the title of the sermon today, or, or I guess the theme that, that's, that I was given, or maybe it's better to say a question <laughs> that I'm trying to answer, is why become a disciple? And there's, there's probably a lot of answers to that question. But I wanted to, to make it simple, to give you a sort of a one-liner here. And I would say that the reason to become a disciple is a disciple has union with Christ. And so to be a disciple is, is that you know Christ, that you, you make Christ known, you dwell in Christ. And that's the essence of discipleship, the union with Christ, to follow him. And so what I wanted to do is, is to look at the text this morning, and there's three ways that I wanted to show you that a true disciple is united with Christ. And so first of all, what we see in this text is that we are united with Christ in his sufferings. Now, it's always difficult to have to to teach on suffering, and it's, it's just increasingly unpopular, right? But the thing is that, that the teaching, the doctrine of suffering, it, it permeates the pages of Scripture. 
I did a concordance search on it, and I couldn't tell you the exact number, but I, I did it online, right? And there's like three pages that you have to click through to see all the instances of, of words like suffering or suffer or suffered or affliction because it's just that present in the Bible. And so how is it that, that suffering, our suffering, causes us to be united with Christ? I've got three ways that I, I want to show you that suffering unites us with Christ. But I, I have to give sort of a, a disclaimer here, I guess, a, a prologue to the reasons. And that is, I have to point out that the one thing our suffering does not accomplish is atonement for sin. Right? Christ alone is able to atone for sin. And Hebrews 9 tells us in verses 26 through 28, speaking of Christ, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And so the Bible clearly tells us that Christ died once for sin, that Christ suffered once for sin, and therefore anyone who is, is in Christ now does not suffer for their sin. Because God is just, and he, he cannot demand punishment twice for the same sin. So if you are in Christ, then Christ is paid once and for all for you. And, and you may suffer, but you do not suffer to pay for your sin, because Christ has already settled that debt. Now, sometimes we do suffer because of our sin, but we don't suffer for our sin. And, and the very idea that our suffering could be to atone for sin is, is absolutely antithetical to the gospel. So just put that out of your mind. But how does suffering unite us to Christ? The first thing I want to point out is that suffering unites us to Christ by conforming us to his character. When you read through Scripture, the portrait that you see painted of Christ is a portrait of suffering, right? In Isaiah 53, Christ is spoken of, and it says, He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet... We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Christ suffered immensely for us. Not only on the cross, but he suffered poverty. He suffered abuse and scorn, and he suffered rejection. He suffered humiliation and misunderstanding and reviling for our sake. And, and if we want to be his disciples, if we are his disciples, then he calls us to be united with him in that suffering. And, and the way that, that our character becomes like his is that, that in our suffering, we mimic his actions. And as we become like him in action and suffering, then we can become like him in character. And so Romans 5, verses 3 and 4 tells us, not only that, but we glory in tribulations because we know that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character produces hope. Also in 1 Peter chapter 2, it tells us, to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. 
And then this final uh, or uh, the scripture from Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now I I ask you, if Christ, who is, the scripture tells us, he is the exact representation of God's character, if he had to suffer, then why should we think that we ourselves can live without suffering. If Christ was made perfect in, in the, the rhetorical sense that the scripture puts it here, through sufferings, then how do we think that we can grow in him without suffering? What we ought to do is we ought to join Paul in rejoicing in our suffering. Because when we suffer, it unites us to Christ, and it cultivates his character in us. The second thing is that our suffering unites us with Christ because it engages us in his labor. What is the labor of Christ? What is the job that he said he was doing? Luke 19.10, Jesus said this himself, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so this, this labor, this mission of Christ that we can join with him in through suffering is to seek and to save sinners. In other words, to make the love, the grace of God known to the world. And so once again, I, I just want to emphasize that our suffering is not atoning for sin. It does not do it that way. And Pastor Mark gave me a, a book um, on some of the martyrs, and it was written by John Piper. So he wrote this in the prologue, and I found it very helpful, so I'll share it with you. But he wrote, concerning the way that our suffering is a witness to the world, he wrote, the voluntary suffering and death, speaking of Christ, to save others is not only the content, it is the method of our mission. We proclaim the good news of what he accomplished, and we join him in the Calvary method. We embrace his sufferings for us, and we spread the gospel by our suffering with him. As Joseph Son puts it in his own case, I am an extension of Jesus Christ. When I was beaten in Romania, he suffered in my body. It is not my suffering. I only had the honor to share his sufferings. Pastor Son goes on to say that Christ's suffering is for propitiation. Our suffering is for propagation. In other words, when we suffer with him in the cause of missions, we display the way Christ loved the world and in our own sufferings extend his to the world. This is what Paul means when he says that he fills up what is lacking in the affliction of Christ. He's not telling us that the suffering of Christ is insufficient to atone for sin, not at all. What he's saying is that the suffering of Christ that atones for sin has not been made manifest to everyone yet. And so he says that, that as an apostle, as, as those who are appointed to spread the gospel, which to one degree or another, all of us are called to that, right? But those who are, are spreading the gospel must make visible the suffering of Christ and, and incarnate, so to speak, that message of the cross. And so in this way, our suffering makes us co-laborers with Christ in winning the world to his kingdom. And then third, our suffering unites us in Christ because it reveals the beauty of Christ to the world. It's paradoxical. It's hard to understand, right? The world cannot understand it. But the thing that that you come to know as a Christian is that the beauty of Christ is just displayed so clearly in the way he suffered for us. And that's why Paul says that that he, when he preaches the gospel, he's preaching the message of the cross, a message of suffering. He also says in this text today, he rejoices in his suffering, and he says, for your sake. 
because he, he's trying to encourage the church. He's trying to say that, that in his own suffering, we can see the beauty of what Christ did for us. Charles Spurgeon wrote this in, in one of his devotionals. He wrote it about the suffering of Christ, but he says, Come, gracious souls, and behold the man in the garden of Gethsemane. Behold his heart so brimming with love that he cannot hold it in, so full of sorrow that it must find expression. Behold the bloody sweat as it distills from every pore of his body and falls upon the ground. Behold the man as they drive the nails into his hands and feet. Look up, repenting sinners, and see the sorrowful image of your suffering Lord. Consider him as the ruby drops stand on the thorn crown and adorn with priceless gems the diadem of the king of misery. Behold the man when all his bones are out of joint and he is poured out like water and brought into the dust of death. God has forsaken him and hell surrounds him. Look and see, was there ever sorrow like his sorrow that is done unto him? All passers-by pause and look upon this spectacle of grief, a wonder to men and angels, an unparalleled phenomenon. Behold the emperor of woe, who had no equal or rival in his agonies. Gaze upon him, you mourners, for if there is no consolation in a crucified Christ, there is no joy in earth or heaven. If in the ransom price of his blood there is no hope, there is no joy in the harps of heaven, and the right hand of God shall know no pleasures forevermore. But there is consolation in the crucified Christ. There is comfort knowing that the captain of our salvation has led the way, even in suffering. We have peace knowing that he suffered once for all for the removal of our sin. And, and therefore, we can know that no matter what our suffering is, we can consider it light and momentary. We can consider that it is winning for us a weight of glory that far surpasses these present afflictions. One of the early church fathers whose story really touches me uh, as a martyr, he's one of the people I, I greatly admire, but his name is Polycarp. He was a student of the Apostle John. And he was killed by the Romans in the second century at the, the Colosseum. But he was brought before the proconsul. And he was told that he would be set free if only he would blaspheme Christ. And his reply was, 86 years I have served him. He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And, and even in the face of death, the thing that's amazing to me about Polycarp is that he, he knew so well, after 86 years, he knew so well the, the goodness, the beauty of Christ, that he was willing to die rather than speak one word against Christ. And, and so that's the witness that our suffering can give to the world. Right To say, Christ is more beautiful to me. Christ is worth more to me than life itself. If I had the time, I, I could tell you dozens of, of stories of martyrs. And, and it, it probably would be beneficial, and, and it's, it's good, because these martyrs, in their deaths, they just so well display the beauty of Christ. And you know, you've probably heard the quote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But I, I don't have the time, so we've got to move on. But I will encourage you, I urge you to, to join Paul when we go through suffering, to say with him, I rejoice in my suffering. And because in our suffering, we have a opportunity to reveal the beauty of Christ. So we're united with Christ in our suffering. And then the second thing is that we are united with Christ in knowledge. 
when we think of knowledge today, when we talk about knowledge, what we usually think of is it's an intellectual thing, right? Intellectual exercise. But when you read the Bible, it talks about knowledge in a little bit of a different way. It's not a bare intellectual activity. When you read the Bible, there's almost always this aspect to knowledge of experience. For example, in Ephesians 3.19, Paul writes, Know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so how, how is it even possible to know something that passes knowledge? But he, he can say it that way because his readers will understand that knowledge is not something that's just intellectual. He's praying for them that they can experience that love of Christ. And if I can give you another example, in 2 Peter 1, verses 5-8, through 8, Peter tells us, For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so again, if knowledge is something that's purely intellectual, then it doesn't really make sense for the Apostle Peter to say, your knowledge should be fruitful, right? You should have all these things that are part of your knowledge of Christ. But he's talking about the knowledge of Christ and entailing all these virtues and these actions because to, to the apostles, to the, the biblical uh, audience it should be that ver- that knowledge entails experience and so with that in mind here's how we are united with Christ through knowledge i want to talk about first what it is that we know what do we know in verse 27 of the text this morning We read, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. And so the thing that we know, the thing that is uniting us to Christ, Paul calls it the mystery. Right? So again, you have this word that that the biblical writers use in one sense, and we can understand it in almost a completely different sense in contemporary America. So what does Paul mean when he says mystery? It's not like a secret, you know. It's not like Sherlock Holmes with his magnifying glass. It's not something that we have to find out. When, when he speaks of a mystery, he's saying that it's a promise whose fulfillment has been revealed. Okay, there, there's some aspect of hiddenness to it still, the meaning of mystery, because he's talking about it, it was a promise, and we, we didn't see it before, but we see it now, right? It was difficult to understand this promise because the fulfillment wasn't here, but we understand it now because the fulfillment has come. And so when Paul speaks of a mystery, what he is referring to is the gospel. This is the mystery because it's, it's the means by which the, the covenant of God is being opened up to the Gentiles. He's speaking of a gospel that tells us of Christ. Very God of very God. Christ, the eternal, omnipotent, all-glorious Second person of the Trinity, Christ who condescended to take on flesh and he became a man and suffered for the sins of men and he died in disgrace. That through faith in him, we could obtain his righteousness and we can be cleansed of our guilt. And most of all, he will live in us if we know and believe the mystery of the gospel. And so that's what we know. That is the thing, the mystery that Paul is talking about. 
We know the truth of the gospel. We know the goodness of the gospel. We know the grace of God that's been extended to us in Jesus Christ. And it's that knowledge that can unite us with Christ. This is the amazing thing, right? If you believe the gospel, then Christ actually lives in you. In Galatians 2.20, Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the life of a true disciple. The life of Christ lived in you. That's what I mean when I talk about the union with Christ that we have. The faith in him. That's what I mean when I talk about knowledge. It's to experience his grace, to have his life in you. The second thing it, with regard to knowledge is how. How do we know what we know? I'm going to give you a really fancy word here because I just like fancy words. <laughs> uh-huh. But the fancy word for how we know things is epistemology. Okay? And in our world today, there's a lot of theories running around about epistemology. Right? So, for example, this one's becoming a little less prevalent, but it was, it was very prevalent I- during the Enlightenment, right? People would say that we know truth through reason and reason alone. Uh, something maybe you've heard more today is that people tell you that we know truth through science, right? Trust the science. Others can say that truth is known by, by your psychology, right? You have to look down deep, examine your deepest feelings, and that's what's true. S- maybe you've heard that this is true because this is my lived experience. All right, these are all methods or, or theories of epistemology, right, of saying how we know what's true. And I don't actually want to discount any of these methods because the thing is that, that often these things actually do discover truth. The problem with them is when you take them and you try to use them as the comprehensive means to know all truth, right? The reality is that each of these things can discover truth, but in a very limited way. Like, for example, science. Science does tell us a lot of true things, but all the true things it can tell us are things about the material world. It can't help us at all to discover any moral truth. You can examine your feelings all you want, and it might tell you something true, but it will tell you something true about your psychological state, right? It's not going to tell you something true about, for example, what your biological nature is. Okay? So, the Bible doesn't tell us, and I don't want to tell you that you have to get rid of these methods, and they can't tell you anything true. Just remember that they're limited. And in the Bible, we do find a comprehensive means to know truth. And so what we see is that the, the biblical, the Christian means of epistemology is through revelation. It's the word of God. And the word of God is given to us in, in its complete, its full form in Christ. Right? Christ is the word of God. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I hope whoever's preaching on chapter 2 doesn't mind. But if you go over to chapter 2 of Colossians, down in verse 3, it says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in John 17, 17, Jesus tells us about how to find truth, right? He says, your word is truth. Hebrews 1, 2 tells us that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so, how do we know? If you want to know, if you want to really, really know, 
if you want to have absolute assurance of truth, then the place that you need to turn to find that is the Word of God. The Word of God contains everything we need to know with regards to faith and godliness. It contains everything which equips the man of God for every good work. It contains everything about who you are, where you came from, where you're going, what your purpose is. It tells us who God is and how he has loved us with an everlasting love. And it tells you how Christ lives in you and gives you his life. I don't want you to hear me saying that you, because we're Christians, then then that's okay to just turn off your brain, ignore reason, that um, we can completely disregard intellectual activity. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you go with reason alone, you can't discover the truths that are most important. Because God has chosen in his grace to make those known through revelation. And if you exercise reason apart from revelation, what you find is despair. If you don't believe me, go read Nietzsche, go read Sartre. There's despair in reason apart from revelation. But if you take your reason and you exercise it within the context of revelation, with the understanding of God's truth, then you will find meaning and fulfillment rather than despair. So I want to encourage you, I want to urge you to value the word of God and hold fast to it. And then thirdly, what do we do with the knowledge? In simple terms, we make it known to others. Paul says here, he was made a minister by the stewardship of God to preach the mystery of Christ among the Gentiles. Now, the thing is that we are not all the Apostle Paul. Uh, We don't all have this calling that he had. But we are all called in Christ. We are all citizens of his kingdom. And the thing that about being a citizen is that as a citizen, you have a duty to the kingdom. You have a calling within the kingdom. Every single one of you here today is given a ministry, and you are to be faithful in your stewardship of that ministry. And so it may not be the first thing, the most important thing you're called to do, But if you are called in Christ, if you are someone who knows Christ, then it should be a priority in your life to also make Christ known. I'm not totally persuaded that that means that you have to go out every day and be knocking on doors and proselytizing. I don't think that means that you have to go out every Thursday and preach on a street corner. Maybe some of you are called to that. And if you are, then God be with you. But the thing is that some of us are called to make Christ known by working faithfully for our employer. Some of us will make Christ known by sharing a meal with a friend. Some of us make Christ known by comforting someone who's mourning. And I I want to encourage you still that you take every opportunity you have to evangelize. Absolutely, evangelism is important. But the thing is that the essence of making Christ known is, is the idea of union with Christ. It's when Christ in you spills out of you. When the reality of the life that you have been given is in Christ is shared with another. Making Christ known is our responsibility and it is our calling. But the beautiful thing is that it's not accomplished by our will. 
nor by our strength. But even in your calling, it's God who's at work in you. So make Christ known. And then the final point today, we are united with Christ in hope. So I want to read again verse 27 here. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is hope exactly? One more, once again, hope is used in a different way in, in today as it was in the scripture. So when you read hope in the Bible, it's not talking about a sort of wishing feeling, right? I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I hope the post office is still open. When you read about hope in the Bible, what you have to understand is that hope is something that is assured. Hope is something that is accomplished. It hasn't arrived, (laughs) but it's assured. It's like certified mail, right? (laughs) Okay. Some of you have less faith in the postal system than I do. But in, in the scripture, hope is not a dubious uh, a sort of dreaming, an aspirational thing. It's something that we are assured of and that we anticipate. And so when you read hope in the Bible, what you can understand is that you are as sure of what you hope for as you are of the one who promised it. And in Christ, we can be absolutely sure. But not only that, God gives us the Holy Spirit to assure us of his promises, right? Romans 5.5, 5, I read 3 and 4 earlier, but verse 5 says, Hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 20 through 22, we read, All the promises of God in Christ are yes, and in him, Amen to the glory of God through us. He who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us. It is God who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So you can be sure of the promise. You can be sure of the hope because God cannot lie. You may be confident in hope. Secondly, what do we hope for? In this passage we're in today, we hope for glory, right? But I ask you, where is glory found? Glory is found in the presence of God. The hope that we have is to be in the presence of God. The only ones who can be in God's presence are those who have Christ in them as their righteousness. And so this is how Christ is the hope of glory for you. Right? Because he is your righteousness. He brings you into God's presence, and that's where you find the glory. There's a sense, though, that that even though Christ is a hope, a future hope of glory, he is the anticipation of heaven for us. He's also our hope and fulfillment of glory right now, in the present. Because with Christ in us, we are already experiencing the presence of God. The presence of God, when when God's people go to be with God, to live with him, that is the joy of all joys, right? That is the apex of history. That is the moment for which all creation is longing. Now, we don't experience that yet in fullness because we have to be made perfect first, right? But we have Christ in us already, and we are 
in him, we are considered righteous. We are positionally perfect, if you will. And so, we do experience, to some extent, that hope of glory already. 1 John 3, 2 tells us, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the hope of glory. So I want to urge you, live in the hope of glory. Live in the hope of glory for the future, but live in the hope of glory in the present, because that is Christ in you. And then the last thing I want to touch on is how does hope change the way we live? Our hope in Christ is our motivation as disciples. Now, the lifestyle of a disciple that I've described so far, I understand, is not necessarily an easy one, right? I'm sure when I said the, pre- the sermon was, why become a disciple, and then I opened up with suffering, some of you were a little confused. Why? Why should I become a disciple so I can suffer? In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, he wrote, despair is suffering without meaning. But what I'm reading here in Colossians, if I can paraphrase a little bit, is that joy is suffering with hope. Suffering without hope is despair. In Christ, suffering, because we have hope, is joy. Now, Viktor Frankl also wrote, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. And that's the way that hope changes us. Hope gives meaning in our suffering. Hope sustains us in our suffering. Because at the end, what we're assured is that the scars of our suffering have companions on the hands and the feet of Christ. That the tears that we cry are caught in in God's bottle and he places them into the treasury of heaven. We know that in every affliction, Christ is with us. That in every affliction, we become more like him in our sorrow. And so the thing in suffering that gives us hope, that changes the way we live, is it drives us to Christ. It drives us to him to find comfort. To be in unity with him. And then that drives us to make that known to others because the hope we have is a real and a glorious hope. Hope in Christ changes everything. Because of this hope, we confess with Paul, who said in Philippians 3, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And so that hope of glory, it dwells with us in Christ. It unites us to him. Because we understand that he is in glory, and so we also shall be with him in glory. And so just to sum up today, I want to go back to the question, why become a disciple? And it's because to be a disciple is to be united to Christ. It's to be found in him. It's to have Christ dwell in you. And that might sound trite. It might sound simple. But when you know Christ, nothing 
could be more persuasive to you to become a disciple. Because Christ is the glory of heaven. Christ is the treasure of all worlds. Christ is the eternal God. Earlier in Colossians, we read, In Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Actually, we're going to read that later in chapter 2. I'm sorry. In Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. In Him, we are complete. Christ is sufficient. So much of the book of Colossians is trying to tell you Christ is sufficient. And Christ is good even in our suffering. Maybe particularly in our suffering. Christ is worth knowing. Christ is our hope. No one satisfies every aspect of our being except Christ. Nothing is as precious when you believe as Christ is. Why become a disciple? So that Christ may be in you the hope of glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have redeemed us. You have called us. We thank you for your great mercy. Thank you for the kindness and the grace that you show us. Lord, as we seek to live in you, I pray that you strengthen us to face each day with its various trials and afflictions because we know that you're in us, that you are our hope and our glory. May our lives be wholly devoted to your service, Lord. May we make known your love and your character. All glory be yours, both now and forever, Lord Jesus. Amen.